Hi, welcome everyone to this session and particular welcome to Shruti. Really pleased that you're able to join us today. I'm going to briefly introduce you, Shruti, before we get into the conversation, which I'm really looking forward to. So Shruti is a professor of, uh, the professor of history and politics here at Cambridge, and her work focuses on modern and contemporary India and global political thought. She's also co-director of the Global Humanities Initiative here at Cambridge, and in that capacity works with seven universities in the Global South, with a focus there on the creation of new, cur new curriculum, new capabilities. She's also a regular commentator on Indian and global politics internationally and does that for the FT, for the BBC, Al Jazeera, Bloomberg and a whole range of Indian media. On top of that, she undertakes advisory work and consultancy. She works with governments, financial institutions and think tanks. And last but by no means least, she's a senior associate with us here at the Institute and contrib contributes in that capacity to a number of our programmes and convening activities. And the first thing I want to ask, just back to your biography, your role here at Cambridge, given that you're a professor of history and politics, I'm interested in how you see the academic disciplines of history and of politics as being relevant to international negotiations on climate change. Well, thank you, Lindsay. It's a real privilege and honor to actually be in conversation with you. Uh, to put it very uh, simply, the kind of optimism that the world collectively had around globalization now no longer seems to be so sure-footed. Uh, partly that's about the change in uh, politics globally with the rise of neo-nationalism. But importantly, I think post the financial crisis of 2008 in, in the West uh, and the rise of China, you also got the rise of other Asian economies, uh, particularly India, which grew at a you know, very fast pace in the early, early decades of this uh, century. And all of this to say that uh, these countries now uh, have acquired a greater say uh, uh, in, in those global negotiations. You saw a version of that actually in Paris, when particularly the Indian, uh, uh, Indian delegation had succeeded in speaking about climate justice. And I think economy is central to it because energy consumption and so on is very high now in places like China and India. You can't ask those countries and with billions of people living there uh, to say that they cannot, they do not have a right for, to prosperity uh, or to, to development. Finally, to just say that in terms of um, my dual kind of disciplinary anchoring in history and politics, what is also clear is to me, particularly because I work in the realm of ideas, uh, among other things, is that there is a very sophisticated set of ideas, policies, and indeed politics in places like India around environmentalism and uh, and capabilities. So that's the first thing I can bring to the table here is that these societies and these poli the, these these polities have a very long uh, history uh, around the environment and human negotiation of the environment. Uh, and I think we need to kind of start attending to that a little bit. So a whole range of dimensions that we really need yeah. to think about and consider that perhaps we uh, have become more prominent or more significant than in the mm -hmm. past. We've been underserved in, in terms of the, the level of attention um, that they've had. But I'm keen to unpack that a little more and understand what that might mean for those of us who are working in support of progress. And firstly, are you optimistic? Are you optimistic that in the context of these shifts, that we are going to be able to make progress to achieve global goals and particularly global climate goals, recognizing that it will require global collaboration to achieve them? Uh, that's a really hard question. The optimism lies and the, the challenge also lies in how we are able to craft new new discussions in you know incubate new ideas which are actually also pragmatic uh which can also you know be be you know operationalized scaled up you know it's in the air that most of the countries are a quite uh, introverted in their own politics and when they are externally relating to each other there's a fair amount of conflict and uh, there's a fair amount of lack of understanding, if I, if I can put it like that. So, um, you know, to not sort of beat around the bush, uh, the question around sort of, you know, at the one level is, are we living in a so-called new bipolarity? Is there an American so-called Western liberal international way of doing things? And is there 
Another way, which is either called multipolarity or it's called the China-led world, or you can say uh, uh, another world, which is sort of global South oriented, the ex-colonized countries which are rising powers with China at the other end. So are we looking at a bipolarity, a multipolarity? All these discussions and a kind of very competitive economic sphere, it is producing this paradox that where we are more in dialogue with each other, uh, but perhaps there is more also friction, conflict, and also, you know, we're not being able to understand. So I think the challenge is going to be to create a, a certain set of like um, minimal goals, things that are very contextually specific. For instance, in a in in coming from India, the question of uh, climate change is now we can unpack it a little bit more, is increasingly going to have to be tied up with questions of not just economic development, of which we know a fair bit, but also to food security and changes in the agrarian pattern. And that's a phenomenon that is also common to, say, other African contexts and, and indeed Latin America. I mean, it is interesting that with, the, with you know, you've had a kind of slightly positive change, a leading voice in, say, Brazil, uh, the Brazilian leadership has come in favor of, you know, uh, the protection of its environment as a key issue. So I think the mistake, the fundamental mistake, really, I think, without being too critical of the preceding discussions in global discussions, the mistake has been made that somehow these global goals, uh, whether, you know, whether they are developmental goals or environmental goals, can be set up uh, in, from the West and can somehow just be implemented uh, elsewhere. I think that model is completely over, both in terms of just the power dynamics, uh, but also a shift in discourses where uh, political leaderships and also the populations of those countries are no, not, no longer willing to take these so-called lectures from the West. So I think we need something more creative, something less antagonistic, uh, uh, but at the same time, something which um, which emerges from these very vast societies, uh, which are actually now the engines of global growth as well. Thank you. A huge amount in there. And uh, so I'm hearing that in practical terms, there's a need to move beyond Western framed approaches. So more inclusive, less Western led approaches that are really linked to you know, real world realities for many of the countries and quite tangible about what that means. And, and as you said, linked to some of the um, national, international imperatives that governments are having to navigate. So I'm interested in practical terms of if there are things that you think that you know, individuals as part of, I'm going to call it a movement, um, could should be doing differently. There's a kind of consciousness, emerging consciousness amongst the young, in particularly in the student body, which means that these sorts of this this kind of very important constituency, uh, not simply the younger generations in India or China are thinking about the environment, but how actually those societies have coped with or not coped with uh, with with it. So one would be that how do you now construct a new uh, institutional paradigms and narratives. So not simply that, well, you know, I personally should not be eating meat because it's bad for the environment, uh, which is all good, or I should be recycling more. So there's a kind of kind of very individuated kind of response to environmental crisis in the West. Uh, whereas actually, if you look at the history of environmentalism in, in India, uh, which is longstanding, whether it is around big dams uh, in the late 19, in the 1990s, uh, for instance, or in the late 60s around forestry. Like, you know, in India, of course, has a very long history of civil disobedience, thanks to Gandhi. So it has always taken the form of civil disobedience, mass movements. Yet there's another level, which I think is more uh, relatable to CISL, which would be actually policy, uh, 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 policy uh, thinking that has emerged in India around energy transition. And as I said, it didn't come from nowhere. This idea of climate justice came from a long series of kind of embedded institutional practices uh, in India, which could then take to Paris and could become a global thing. 
So institutionally, I think, uh, uh, particularly something like your, you know, CISL, which you know uh, can network these very precise new const older and newer constellations of policy building. And here, I actually think uh, one of the ways to do it would be to triangulate the global south, so global south south dialogue. So, for instance, you know, work that CISL does with South Africa. How can that be linked up, and how can these societies learn from each other uh, with South Asia or India. So I see actually the work in two ways. One, to kind of shift the narrative through, through a kind of creative uh, exchange of policy and knowledge and ideas ac across the global South, which then are not directed by the West, as it were, but CISL can convene it, CISL can find the strategic partnerships that will allow this to kind of scale up. Thank you. So you've talked about some of the um, infrastructure or, you know, if you talk about globalization, you talked about some of the multilateral infrastructure and what we might need uh, in future. You also talked about the importance of narrative and, and encourage them looking at what language is being used in other economies. Is there any, are there any narratives that you find that are really unhelpful and you think are getting in the way and that we need to let go of or perhaps not, not uh, <laughs> or rely too heavily on? This is difficult and I don't want to sound um, judgy. The fact that there is a highly individuated language around environmental politics, climate change, uh, consumerist restraint that is emerging here, uh, absolutely fine, no problem. Uh, that doesn't match on at all in a place like India. And which does not therefore mean that people are not doing this or the fact that there is no politics. Quite the opposite. Uh, there's a lot of politics around, in, uh, around climate justice, as I said, around ideas of food security, around actually pollution, uh, you know, air pollution in, in mega cities. So also like in, you know, places like India have very different challenges at the moment. So let me just sort of say like, this is winter, uh, you know, North India is, particularly Delhi, is engulfed with smog, you would have seen, right? Uh, and this is not to say that people don't have a kind of consciousness around it. How can you not? You're living that toxic air, you know? And this, but then this, it would not simply be about saying, well, um, people should not be using cars. How are you supposed to get around, you know, get around that city? So I think, uh, what is then required is, because that smog is related to agricultural production in the north, the burning of stubble, and there's a way in which a new discourse is emerging that perhaps a North Indian uh, farmer should now not be producing paddy. It should not be, you know, it should move to millets or it should move to a different agrarian, uh, 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 agrarian practice. So those things are emerging from those countries itself and, and, Plus, there's a real issue of scale, and which I think you know we're not quite sensitive to in terms of the scale of the problem or the scale of the challenge uh, uh, itself. And I think uh, the purist, puritan, puritanism would have to go uh, in terms of making simply climate as the ultimate thing, but act, or climate emergency, but actually to see how these three or four or five things are competing with each other and producing a new set of policies. And we are seeing that in India. You're seeing the emergence, opening of coal mines, uh, some, not many, but but you're also seeing this huge investment, uh, eye-watering amount of investment in solar energy. In terms of air pollution, I mean, I've always been struck how recent it was that London was had very dirty air. I mean, it's still not perfect. So what could places like London uh, provide in terms of pol policy expertise? Uh, how is it that a political consensus was arrived at uh, in Britain? So I think those sorts of conversations would be very, I think, helpful and interesting, uh, and I would say impactful. Absolutely. And specifically on that point, we've had a, a number of uh, government municipality um, delegations of leaders from um, a number of countries in, in Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, come to us for what they've called London Smog Programs. How yes. can they learn from what it took mm -hmm. to achieve that cleaning up of the air? Admittedly, a huge amount, still more to be done and not a thing that we've by any means cracked. Um, 
So I want to move from uh, the kind of the diagnosis and the commentary and that laying out a big context and come specifically then to, uh, to COP28 and move instead to prediction. So I want to ask you what, what you think, the, what outcomes do you think we're likely to see from this forthcoming COP? So I think, uh, let me contextualize one thing. I think um, the G20 in India, uh, so what is, you know, there's a parallel set of multilateral conversations going on. And I think it's really interesting that four major global South countries are were, are convening the G20 in succession. So it started with Indonesia, then India, then Brazil, and then South Africa. In two years, it will be in South Africa. So there's a way in which that dialogue is getting, um, it's getting a kind of institutional structure, but it's also getting a momentum. And uh, where these countries have like really uh, set the tone uh, for, for negotiation that this cannot simply be about Europe or it cannot simply be about, you know, moving national, as it were, carbon one country to another or jurisdictions that, you know, you, I mean, the, the challenge around net zero, for instance, A, that it has occupied a very central uh, place in the discussions uh, of, of COP. Uh, but as you see from the global south, uh, the challenge is that when you have a net zero policy, which says um, it will be met in 2070, which is in India, that's the, the, the claim, uh, that's the kind of uh, pledge, then there's a real problem of immediacy or even uh, the real problem of kind of you know making something actionable, uh, giving it the urgency it, it requires. So for me, the success would be how debates around net zero energy transition are tied in more firmly uh, with, as I said, development uh, and also justice around these these guys. So that would be one touchstone. The second touchstone would be whether the global South speaks in unison uh, or which which it did in, in Paris, which is why it was a success uh, uh, relative. And, and thirdly, how receptive uh, are, as it were, the, the leading economies like America is especially, and the European Union, uh, on these 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 dialogues is the cop story going to now match up with the g20 story where the where as it were emerging economies have had a bigger say than ever before yeah. and so that's that's for me the touchstone uh, and i don't mean simply china or i don't mean simply india but more connected global south brazil south africa uh, particularly I'm keen to turn now to the role of business and financial institutions. Uh, as you know, CISL works with business, with finance, with government around um, how we can support those institutions so that their core activity is contributing to more sustainable outcomes, sustainable economy. Um, and I know that your work is increasingly working um, with business and finance sector. And within this context in which you've outlined with very significant uh, regional and national interests, and mm. effectively what I'm hearing is that debates around climate change are becoming central to um, international politics, trade mm. negotiations, and so on. I've seen a lack of government leadership over recent years on climate change. We've seen commitments, but not necessarily leadership. And there's been a lot of um, focus, therefore, on the private sector to step up and show leadership because they have a vested interest in getting to a stable climate and, and thriving economies and so on. But in the context you've outlined, I'm interested in what you now see as a role of business and financial institutions. Should they be stepping up and stepping into lead, or are is our nation states, our national governments, now back in the driving seat? Given how politicised um, some of these these uh, issues are, but certainly in the West, you get a fair amount of discussion around climate emergency, uh, and uh, so I think there uh, the work of uh, the private sector can be productively used because it's you know they are driving much of the world economy. In the last 10 years, uh, national governments have kind of, uh, you know, uh, reclaimed, I would say, a little bit more power that they had begun to, if not lose, but were sharing with the world of business and finance in the early stages, like earlier globalization. I think leadership um, um, of the young needs to be nurtured for sure. In India, I mean, just to bring it back, you have a very strong network of civil society action 
uh, very long-standing civil society groups. Uh, these are mostly homegrown. They are not necessarily internationally funded. Uh, how do we learn from them and what are the challenges they are facing uh, in terms of not just politics, but say emerging disasters, emerging uh, climate emergencies? I think the baseline would have to be that the business world will have to see an incentive in it uh, uh, for them. And that would have to be, yeah, I said, you know, innovation led and but also I think a, a greater uh, a greater dialogue between um, uh, politics and business, uh, because at the moment you're getting a, like a kicking of the ball between the two sectors. And then you bring a third element, as I said, of the, the politicians, which so. I think joined up thinking with joined up sectors. I have very limited experience, but uh, with it, that I was quite struck by um, profit incentive, which means that uh, the work around energy transition uh, will, will be very cha challenging. I, I mean, uh, f uh, being a realist, I think the moral language doesn't work. So how do you incentivize it? And that's where I think the work of governments uh, is important because it's the governments that can also create structures of incentive. Uh, I'm keen to um, to move on to talk about the role that individuals uh, mm. and individual leaders um, yes. within our network can play. I think individual capacities and individual leadership is incredibly important. And uh, yet uh, what has happened is that we are, there's a scarcity of it. I can see that, you know, why politicians would be reticent because, you know, they they need to win an election every five years. I mean, they're very accountable. It's a high risk job they are in, right? Um, is there any way in which we can begin to convince individual leaders who do not need to kind of work with such tight, high risk stakes? Uh, and then they can be networked with political leaders. I do think it's a matter of time framing of net zero to 2070 means that the immediacy is lost. Uh, the, the, the same problem is the opposite for politicians because they're in an immediate political cycle, they're not able to think of the midterm. And I think universities which have this you know, unique position to think about the immediate and the long-term can, start bridging this gap between something which is so future oriented and something which is more immediate. And I therefore do think individual leaders, but institutions like CISL, incredibly important. I mean, you know, India's had major environmental leaders uh, in the past, and I can think of them, some very inspiring women, some very inspiring older men, some of them are not no longer alive, but, you know, uh, I don't see comparable I don't see a comparable political, a, a comparable leadership emerging. And what is it that we can do to generate, engender it, I think. Thank you. So you've talked about, um, given some examples of youth leadership, you've talked about the context within le in which leaders are operating, that some of the constraining or enabling conditions and, and the tyranny of having to, to you know, win votes on a regular electoral cycle um, being somewhat challenging there, and talked about a particular, I suppose, capability, the ability to both to, mm -hmm. to be able to, I suppose, ride two horses at once, that succeed in the short term, but be navigating to the long term as a, as a thing that effective leaders may need to do. Uh, given that we're a leadership institute and, and all of our work is in some way working to inspire, support, enable leaders, I'm interested in whether you think there are any um, other examples of capabilities or, or insights that, that leaders um, should be nurturing you know, themselves within their teams, within their sphere of influence, um, to add to that sense of you know, balancing, managing both for the short term and long term. Is there anything else that you'd encourage leaders to be nurturing? You know, I think what is desperately required is a kind of shift from uh, this competitive story, which has now become very ingrained, that the West has consumed, it's now the turn of Asia to consume. So this rich versus poor, our rising power story now needs a new framework uh, for, for, for actually the sake of humanity to succeed. Uh, and this would obviously mean a certain relinquishing of very major frameworks of thinking in the West, uh, and to not simply think of those places as, you know, 
competitors or, you know, uh, or antagonists or even pupils, you know, that, you know. So I think for me, the the greatest challenge is that having diagnosed that this is the, this is the resetting required. Uh, so there can't be real leadership without new ideas. How do we kind of reset it? And for that, I think, uh, again, I mean, not to sort of fly the flag of the university once more, but I think that's where intellectual work, intellectual leadership will 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 produce, uh, will help produce the new political leadership. Yeah. Thank you. So back to the to university and your role within that, your day job as a historian with a strong interest in politics. Are there any lessons from history that you would encourage us to take about how we can enable international collaboration on the scale we need to see for the urgency of the challenges, the interconnected challenges that we're facing? Are there any lessons we can draw from history to inform us for the future? What we are living in is unprecedented, uh, uh, you know. Um, so I think there are there are certain lessons uh, to learn. Okay, so let me give the example of what happened to India's amazing forests in the 19th century. The story of empire is also the story of en environment because India's forests were kind of, you know, you know, uh, depleted uh, precisely for the emerging uh, global uh, network around railways. And the most important work on environmental history actually, you know, 30, 40 years ago came out of India, you know, talking about that. Of course, today we talk in terms of decolonization, but I think that my 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 worry or my uh, caution would be that uh, how to prevent a colonization of the planet again, or a colonization of vast numbers of people, whether they are by a small conglomerate. So I think uh, the the story of empire has come back uh, in every way. And uh, the lesson would be that how not to repeat that um, and how to then make sure that there's an equitable, more just human order. Thank you very much. You provided us with a huge amount of food for thought, an amazing um, uh, building out of a whole range of dimensions that we and the organizations and individuals that we're working with are really being thoughtful about as we prepare for engage with COP, but, but COP is only one uh, dimension of a, of a huge landscape uh, that we really need to engage with and some really powerful uh, insights there, particularly around the need to really shift some of our worldviews, mm -hmm. mindsets and be open to and be nurturing new ideas and new thinking. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Lindsay.